Hello, everyone. Welcome to the ISE webinar, connecting you with experts in the ICT industry to help improve network infrastructure for today and tomorrow. I'm Joe Gillard, editor of ISE Magazine and ISE Expo. Thank you for joining us today for our ISE webinar, Homes Pass to Homes Connected, Selecting the Right OSP Drop Cable for the Job. Uh, we're presented in partnership with HFCL. So before we get started, please remember to renew or subscribe to ISC Magazine to stay informed and get your own copy, print or digital. Just click on the information tab or go to iscmag.com slash subscribe. Um, today's webinar is sponsored by HFCL. HFCL is a leading technology company specializing in creating digital networks for telcos, MSOs, enterprises and governments. Over the years, HFCL has emerged as a trusted partner offering sustainable high-tech solutions with a commitment to provide the latest technology products to customers. Their strong R&D expertise, coupled with their global system integration services and decades of experience in fiber optics, enable them to deliver the innovative digital network solutions required for the most advanced networks. Now let me tell you just a little bit about our presenter today. Dr. Peter A. Wyman is CTO of HFCL's Optical Fiber and Cable Business Unit, currently based in Atlanta, Georgia. His responsibilities include leading product and process development for optical fiber, optical cable, and connectivity products within the HFCL group. He has over 25 years' experience in the fiber and cable industry, starting as a materials development engineer with Lucent Technologies Bell Labs in Norcross, Georgia. His technical work has included development of new materials for optical cables, design of cables for outside plants, FTTH and data center applications, and evaluation of the cabled performance of novel optical fibers. He has been granted 56 U.S. patents on optical fiber cable technology. Dr. Wyman holds Bachelor of Science degrees in Materials Science and Engineering and Organizational Management from the University of Pennsylvania and a Ph.D., in materials science and engineering from the University of Minnesota. We recommend you view the webinar in full screen mode for the best visual quality of our presenter's slides. You can do this by clicking on the two outward arrows at the top right corner of the slides. The information tabs at the top of your screen will allow you to find out more information about our speakers and sponsor. To receive a copy of the slides from today's presentation, you will find them behind the event resources tab located just underneath the ask a question area on the left side of your screen and check the event resources tab for additional documents. We also ask that you submit questions throughout the presentation by using the ask a question tab on the left. I'll hold these questions until our Q&A session at the end of the webinar, at which time we'll answer as many as possible. A certificate of attendance will be issued for attending this live webinar in its entirety. You may use this certificate of attendance to apply for professional development hours with your company, town, or state's governing certification agency. A link to download the certificate will be emailed to you at the conclusion of the webinar. Now, I would finally like to hand the webinar over to our presenter, Dr. Peter Wyman. Thank you, Peter. Thanks, Joe, uh, and uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending upon where you are in the world. Uh, one thing before I get started, uh, I second uh, Joe's recommendation to subscribe to ISE. The January issue is just out. There's some really good stuff on the economic outlook for uh, 2024. Um, always interesting stuff when the, uh, the new issue comes out. <clears throat> um, as Joe said, the title of the presentation today is from homes passed to homes connected, cabling considerations for outside plant fiber to the home. Um, before I get into the, the meat of the presentation, um, just want to uh, elaborate on Joe's great introduction of who HFCL is. Um, we're new here in North America. Um, we've only uh, been active in the North American market for a little bit over a year, but as a company, we've been around for a while. Uh, the picture on the top left of the slide uh, is our manufacturing campus in Hyderabad, India in South Central India, it's actually an out of date photo. Uh, it shows our uh, original uh, draw building and our cable plant at that campus. Um, actually, if I had a current drone picture right now, uh, it would show that the uh, size of the fiber draw building is more than doubled. Um, we are expanding our fiber draw capacity from 12 million fiber kilometers a year to 34 million fiber kilometers a year by the middle of next year. Um, 
company's uh, uh, over 37 years, uh, started out as an engineering planning and construction company building telecom networks in India, um, but has backward integrated into cable and fiber technology, uh, regional offices, several countries around the world. Um, we've sold our product in over 60 countries worldwide. We have five different manufacturing plants across four sites in India. Um, and uh, our cable capacity right now is quite large, and we're expanding that uh, uh, by the middle of this year uh, as well across our three cable factories. Quick overview of today's presentation. Um, first, we'll review the current state of FTTH here in North America, um, do a, a brief review of uh, pond, to pond topologies for FTTH distribution, um, and then uh, discuss uh, the, the meat of the presentation is going to be design considerations for selecting drop cables for the home or business connection. And the two critical questions to ask are, what's the right of way? How am I going to get there? And then how will the drop be terminated, both at the distribution end uh, and at the subscriber end? So the Fiber Broadband Association, uh, which HFCL is a member of, uh, just uh, published their uh, updated state of the FTTH business at the end of last calendar year. Uh, we're up to 78 million home passings, uh, 9 million added last year, despite the market in general being slow. And the take rate uh, on average uh, is about uh, a little over 45%. Um, so we've got uh, already got about 35 million unique homes uh, on FTTH, uh, including mine. Um, the forecast, and here's uh, some more data, um, as we actually go from putting in the distribution networks to actually connecting the individual homes, um, is that over the next 10 years, uh, we'll get to 100 million homes passed. Um, estimated both public and private FTTH investment in the U.S. Uh, in the next five years, uh, 135 billion. Um, and on top of that, you know, this isn't just the U.S., uh, this is uh, North America and Caribbean, uh, significant, significant, significant expansions planned in both Canada uh, and the Caribbean. Uh, when the service providers talk about um, uh, their FTTH plans to Wall Street and others, um, the metric that's been used for about two decades now has always been homes passed. I always talk about homes passed, and that's necessary um, to get where you want to be in building an FTTH network, but it's not sufficient. Uh, when you pass a home, you've spent a lot of money to build a distribution network, and you have an opportunity to win the press release and uh, win your uh, quarterly conference call with uh, Wall Street. And here's three examples from, from last year. Uh, one is uh, Wire 3, a small ISP down in Florida, uh, trying to get to 15,000 homes a month. Um, Altice and their optimum service in the Northeast um, is uh, talked about what they added. Uh, and then uh, Frontier talked about adding over 1.3 million uh, homes passing past planned last year. So that's always what you see in the press releases. That's always what you see in the uh, the ISE newsletter and the other industry newsletters. But what's really important isn't passing a home. What's important is connecting a home. Um, connecting the home is what turns your investment into revenue for the long haul. Um, what can you do when you actually hook up the home? Well, the first thing you can do is you can make some pretty happy customers. Um, CableTV.com uh, just last month published a, uh, uh, their survey of uh, customer satisfaction. Um, and the most satisfied customers were either FTTH uh, or wireless. Uh, Starlink actually did pretty well, but I suspect that's because the people who are going to Starlink are going from DSL or no connection at all um, to uh, having a reasonably fast broadband connection, though not as fast as what you can get from an MSO uh, or from fiber. Um, and uh, the people who do are doing uh, 5G uh, wireless connections also seem to be pretty happy as well, although I'll note that those 5G towers are all fed by fiber to the antenna typically. But the uh, uh, three of the highest performing um, service providers were fiber. Um, and then just off that list, just off the bottom of that list, Verizon, FTTH, AT&T, fiber, or Verizon Fios, AT&T Fiber um, are almost as high as these uh, these top five. And interestingly, um, all of the um, telcos providing fiber um, have better customer service um, ratings than the MSOs. The highest of the MSOs was Spectrum at, uh, at 64%. Um, 
So generally customers are very happy with their FTTH service when they get there. Um, but FTTH does a number of other things. Um, you can deliver a reliable service. The nice part about FTTH is it's completely passive um, from the uh, head end or central office out. Uh, you're not moving electrons. There's a lot less to break. Um, and customers see that as being the very best. Um, in the um, Fiber Broadband Association survey, over 60% of co uh, potential customers see FTTH as the best possible service. Uh, the other thing that's interesting is once you get someone on FTTH, that's going to minimize churn. Um, their survey, the Fiber Broadband Association survey, uh, showed that people are making net movement to FTTH and wireless uh, and away um, from uh, DSL uh, and cable internet. And once they get on fiber, they stay because they're happy with the quality of the service. Um, I'll do just a couple quick slides on FTTH distribution architectures. Um, the, uh, you know, the, I guess the thesis of this presentation is that you've got your distribution in place and you have to figure out how to get to the home. But a quick review of how to get from the CO or the head end um, to close to the home um, uh, is uh, uh, useful uh, in this situation. Um, this is taken uh, with uh, acknowledgement and thanks from uh, Jim Hayes' uh, website at the uh, Fiber Optic Association. Uh, you should check this out if you haven't. Um, there's some really great resources uh, on that website and educational resources. And rather than reinvent the wheel, uh, I tip my hat to Jim as I uh, uh, borrow from uh, uh, what uh, he and his team at FOA have, at the FOA have put together. Um, a lot of the original FTTH architectures were so-called home run architectures, where there was a dedicated fiber uh, all the way from the CO um, to each premises. Um, you'd run a multi-fiber cable to a splice point out in the field and then connect the individual fibers uh, to the uh, uh, homes or businesses. Um, what's become much more common is a so-called centralized split, where you run uh, a cable connecting um, the central office typically to a splitter cabinet out in the field. And then um, typically you'll add up to a one by 64 split in the end, um, usually a one by two at the CO and then a one by 32 in the splitter cabinet. And then from that, you'll connect each of the uh, uh, individual premises. Uh, although if you're going with a very short reach, sometimes you can do the split uh, in the CO itself. Um, something that's becoming much more common um, is distributed split where, or cascaded split uh, where you have um, uh, different split ratio, or you have different amounts of splitting out in the field, you'll split a signal once and then split it again. Um, usually with a, again, you'll get to this similar kind of one by 64 split ratio, but maybe you'll do it by splitting one by eight at the first splitter and splitting one by eight at the second splitter. Then the, uh, the final uh, potential architecture, and there's actually a good article about this in the January ISE magazine, uh, is the fiber tap or unbalanced split, um, where uh, this is somewhat similar to uh, a CATV architecture, where at the first uh, drop point, um, you'll split off, uh, you'll do a 90-10 split, 90% 90 of the signal will continue down, and then 10% will be split to an individual customer. Um, that architecture is becoming more common for rural FTTH, um, which is becoming more prominent with uh, uh, bead money and uh, some of the other uh, planning, you know, some of the customers that haven't been reached yet are in rural areas, and uh, that might require a different uh, different kind of architecture. So uh, this is a bit of an eye chart, and I'm not going to read it, but it uh, uh, just highlights the, the pros and cons and typical uses of the different uh, architectures. Um, Home Run, or a P2P point-to-point network, um, has the advantage of near unlimited bandwidth. Change out the line card, and you can deliver as much bandwidth as the user wants. Um, but it has the disadvantage of having a very high material uh, cost, because you need an awful lot of fiber, and a high labor cost, because usually there's a lot of splicing involved. Uh, and it's actually not that common anymore for FTTH because of the expense. Um, Centralized split is uh, a good architect. Uh, the advantage there is it's uh, relatively low electronics cost because a uh, few of your uh, optical line terminal ports in the CO get wasted. You have one port that goes to a one by 32 split out in the field um, and you connect that to 32 homes. Um, 
you might uh, leave some of those ports open in the splitter cabinet if people don't take the service, but you end up not wasting ports. Um, another advantage is uh, easy uh, maintenance and troubleshooting um, because there's one spot where everything goes and that's the splitter cabinet. Um, disadvantages, you're gonna spend a little more on the cable because you're gonna need higher fiber count cable. Uh, one thing that uh, a lot of municipalities, subdivisions and the like uh, have issues with is the cabinet itself. These are pretty big. They're the size of uh, a large freezer um, typically. And so where are you gonna put that? Are you gonna put that on the sidewalk? Or are you gonna put that in someone's front lawn? Um, there's often pushback on that for aesthetic reasons. And there's typically a lot of splicing involved and splicing uh, is expensive. Um, best used in high density areas and where you have a relatively low expected take, take rate because of the efficiency in electronics. Um, the, uh, anyway, the uh, uh, distributed split, um, which is again becoming more popular, uh, the good news is you can use lower fiber count cables and you don't need the cabinet. You can use, everything gets smaller with low fiber count cable. Um, your splitters can be housed in splice closures or pedestals. And so it's maybe aesthetically more pleasing. Um, there's also less splicing involved because there's less fiber. Um, the disadvantage is that uh, potential higher electronics cost. Uh, you can strand OLT ports uh, depending upon what your take rates are. Um, and also the maintenance and troubleshooting is harder because uh, you have to trace signal through the multiple splitter points. Um, most common use is medium to low density areas uh, in suburban and rural areas. Um, it's also a convenient architecture for MDUs, although I'm focused on outside plant in this talk. Uh, you can put the second split in the basement uh, of an apartment building or on the uh, premises of a, uh, say, a townhouse development. Um, and if you have a high take rate expected, um, then uh, you'll use your electronics efficiently. Um, the fiber tap or unbalanced split approach, uh, the, good, the good parts, very low fiber count cables um, and therefore less expensive. And you can use very small footprint infrastructure when doing it. Um, but it's probably the highest potential electronic cost per home. And it's the hardest troubleshooting because there's so many different split points where things are going on. And if you have to, it might take you a while to localize the break to repair. And where it's typically used is the, the low density urban areas. Or, I'm sorry, low density rural areas. Um, just to point out, typical cable selection for these distribution networks, uh, centralized split, um, the general purpose loose tube type cables are most common. Uh, flat ribbon uh, may also be used, although uh, typically in centralized split, your uh, distribution cable will hit uh, multiple splitter cabinets. And so uh, the, the loose tube might be a little easier to work with because it's easier to do mid-span access. You can access one tube or two tubes at a time rather than doing the whole cable. Uh, and another thing we're seeing more of is uh, micro cable going, that's jetted into micro -tucked. And again, higher fiber counts. Uh, with the distributed split and um, fiber tap architectures, you can use lower fiber count cables, uh, the general purpose or the micro cable. And one thing that you can even do if it's a uh, rural enough or if it's a small enough area or rural area is you can get into really small cables like a dry central tube loose fiber. Uh, what I'm showing here is a picture of a 24 fiber um, central tube cable uh, that's very small, very robust, intended for direct burial. Um, and that might be ideal um, if you're doing a, a fiber tap or a fairly uh, uh, low density uh, distributed split area where you don't need a huge amount of fiber. So with that sort of uh, quick review class of what the distribution network looks like, um, now on to uh, drop to the subscriber. And if there's one thing to, uh, to take away um, from this presentation today, uh, it's that uh, one size doesn't fit all. Um, it depends upon the specific application, uh, the specific area you're building, um, and what's important to you as a service provider. Um, there's some value judgments to make about what the uh, uh, best way to reach the home is. Um, these pictures are actually uh, from my house. Uh, I'm in my home office today uh, speaking to you over an FTTH connection. Uh, this is the pole. It's uh, uh, in my neighbor's uh, front yard with the power and CATV and actually two fiber to the home networks all running over it. Um, and then this is the, uh, the DMARC box and the cable running into my house. 
um, that uh, I'm speaking to you over right now. But the first question is, what's the right of way that you're going to use? Are you going to go aerial, buried, or in conduit? And then the next critical question is, how are you going to terminate these cables at both the distribution end and the subscriber end? And there's trade-offs associated uh, with all of these, and the rest of this, uh, this webinar will review them. Um, so the first question is, uh, what right of way? Uh, are you going to go aerial, um, where the cable that's most commonly used is the dielectric flat drop, um, roughly eight by four and a half millimeters? Uh, are you gonna go direct buried, where you can put an armor drop in or a tonable drop in and uh, hand plow it into somebody's yard? Um, or are you going to try to use a, a microduct type solution where you might use a, a blown fiber unit um, and it's not even a cable, it's just a, a protective tube for fibers and, and small plastic. Uh, these are all options um, depending upon the specific requirements of uh, where you're installing cable. Um, each right of way is a different advantage and disadvantage. Um, Aerial, and this was just emphasized by the uh, most recent Fiber Broadband Association uh, study that came out actually this month, uh, Aerial is going to be your lowest cost to build. Um, right now in the U.S., building Aerial is less than half the cost of underground, um, based on the most recent Fiber Broadband Association study that came out um, uh, last month. And uh, it's going to be the fastest. Uh, there's nothing to dig. Uh, you can get the bucket truck out and go pretty fast. Um, the disadvantages are aerial just isn't as reliable as an underground solution. Um, you've got uh, wind blowing over poles. You've got ice. There's probably going to be ice in the northeast U.S. today. Uh, heavy, wet snow um, from uh, Pennsylvania to Boston. Uh, trees fall, branches fall. That Actually, a tree fell in my front yard and took out my drop cable in uh, 2020 or 2021. Um, in more rural areas, uh, you run in, or in suburban areas, you run into squirrels and birds that can damage the cables. Uh, and occasionally, even have people uh, taking a shot at a bird on a wire and uh, causing shotgun damage. And then um, aesthetics are sometimes a concern, uh, especially in sort of planned subdivisions. People may not like uh, uh, the pole infrastructure. They may want everything buried because it looks nicer. Um, Direct buried does have the uh, advantages on once you get it deep enough, it's going to be pretty much resistant to weather and the aesthetics are going to be uh, better because everything's going to be hidden. Um, it's going to be higher cost. And if you direct bury the cable, um, you're going to have some potential issues with burrowing animals uh, like gophers and moles and the like, and also vulnerable to uh, uh, damage from dig ups and cuts. Uh, duct for FTTH. It's going to be the most reliable. You have two layers of protection between the fiber and the world, the jacket uh, on the fiber itself um, and the duct. Um, another advantage of having a duct is you can do a rip and replace. You can pull out the cable that's in there and uh, install another one by jetting or pulling or pushing. And of course the aesthetics uh, are good, but it's going to be the highest cost. Um, there's two passes. First, you've got to put in the duct and then you've got to come back in and put in the cable. Um, you know, in many cases, it may make the most sense to do duct if you're doing something that's uh, truly greenfield, that uh, uh, you can put the duct in before the uh, uh, sod gets laid in a new subdivision, for example. Um, and it is just because it's reliable doesn't mean that it's uh, bulletproof. Um, it's still vulnerable to dig ups. It's still potentially vulnerable to, uh, to animal attack. Um, taking a different Case by case, um, if aerial, if you're going with aerial, um, what's your span length and what's your storm loading district? Uh, the uh, picture on the left is the uh, NESC uh, heavy, medium, and light uh, loading districts uh, across North America. Um, again, the dielectric flat drop um, shown in the upper right um, is the most popular cable for aerial. And the reason for that, is, one of the reasons for that is that you can get a really long span length up to uh, 100 meters in NESC light um, in a pretty compact package um, with this cable. And those span lengths, even in heavy, are typically enough to cover almost every possible uh, use case for aerial installation. Um, but there are options. Um, there are round dielectric drops available um, that are smaller and don't have the stiffness and preferential bending of the flat drop. Um, I've heard people tell me 
Uh, I love the flat drop. It's almost indestructible. And I, people tell me I love the flat or I hate the flat drop. Um, it's too hard to bend, too hard to work with. So a round drop could be an option um, if you find that the, uh, the stiffness of the flat drop is too much, but the span length isn't as high. It's going to be, um, depending upon the loading district, anywhere from one third to one half uh, the span length. Uh, on the other hand, uh, a round cable has the advantage of no preferential bend. Um, slack coils will be much smaller. Uh, reels will be much smaller. Um, weight will be smaller. Um, so you know, if you are in a situation where your span lengths aren't that high, um, uh, a round drop uh, might be uh, a, legit, a legitimate option to consider. Um, one of the reasons for the popularity of the uh, dielectric flat drop is the wedge clamp shown on the right. That was originally developed for copper um, telco telephone drop, the, the so-called uh, uh, Rectech flat A drop type copper drop, uh, which actually my house had uh, connected to the street when I moved in. Uh, in uh, 2000. Um, this uh, the clamp I happen to show is the Diamond Sachs wedge clamp, which is now made by PPC and has been around for over 50 years. Um, and it's uh, very reliable, very easy to use. Um, people uh, are familiar with it and this flat drop is compatible with it. Um, the round drop, uh, you can't use the wedge type clamp. You'll have to go to a, uh, uh, something like the formed wire dead end clamp I show on the right. Um, those clamps are a little bit more expensive than the uh, wedge clamp, um, but with the uh, uh, reduction in material and the uh, advantages of working with something round that's a little easier to bend, for an individual situation, um, that combination might be, a, might be a better choice. Next, moving on to the, uh, the buried right of way, um, you know, questions you have to ask are, um, do you want to make sure that the cable is locatable or tonable, um, or do you want to uh, do you want to go with an armored cable? Um, there are choices again here. Uh, you certainly want to be able to find the thing after you put it in the ground. And I show pictures of uh, flags marking where the cables are, and someone using a, a test device to locate where the cable is uh, before people like the guys in the lower left come in and dig up your yard to put in a sprinkler system or put in a new water line or that sort of thing. Uh, another concern about uh, merely using tonable or going with armored uh, is animal attack. Uh, the picture I show in the sort of middle bottom, uh, that's the Plains Pocket Gopher. Um, back when uh, uh, there was still uh, the USDA could still do animal testing of cables, that was the reference animal that was used to test the uh, rodent resistance of cables. Um, they chew, they wouldn't eat the cable jacket, but they chew anything if they don't chew uh, their teeth grow too much and um, they actually starve. So they have to chew to keep their teeth wearing down like rabbits and other animals. Um, and uh, if you're in an area where there's wildlife like that, you might consider um, a steel armor drop like the one on the lower right. It's bigger, it's heavier, um, but a piece of formed steel around the cable core is going to be the most robust thing against animal attack. Um, but you might also go uh, as an alternate um, What's commonly used is you can bury a, a flat drop that has a copper wire that's uh, uh, attached to the uh, main cable by a web. So if you're less concerned about animal attack, the copper wire um, could have uh, uh, lets you find the cable. And it also that figure that figure eight structure has the advantage of um, with the dry armor drop. When you touch the house, you're going to have to bond and ground that cable, um, and that's going to take more time and cost more money. With the tonable drop, you simply Peel the, um, you can peel the wire away by hand, snip it, and you don't have to bond and ground at the house. Um, so it's a matter of which way you want to go. Um, and uh, uh, the dry armored, uh, the armored drops are going to be um, most invulnerable to attack, but they're going to be bigger and heavier and require a little more labor to install. Um, <clears throat> One thing we did to you know, try to illustrate how tough these cables are um, is I went to the folks in the lab and said, uh, let's test some of these guys to failure. Uh, let's, let's really destroy them and uh, compare what the standards say to what these cables are, are capable of doing. So we did um, abusive test to failure of the crush resistance and impact resistance of typical buried drops. Uh, the first one we did was the dry armor ground drop. 
Um, the American National Standard for Drop Cable, ICEA 717, uh, requires that you expose the cable to uh, 100 Newton, uh, which is about, I'm trying to do math in my head, about a 20 pound uh, crushing load over, a, or a 200 pound crushing load over a, um, a four inch wide plate. Uh, you do that for a minute and then you back off, drop the load to half that for 10 minutes and then measure the signal loss. And the signal loss can't be more than four tenths of a dB uh, at 1550. So um, I said to the guys in the lab, let's test this sucker till it breaks. Um, we were able to take it up while measuring attenuation um, up to uh, 600 Newtons per centimeter, um, which is 12 times the industry standard load. Uh, with low attenuation. When we went up to 800, um, we broke a couple fibers. So uh, it'll do uh, 12X the industry standard, it won't do 16. Um, but these are very tough little cables. Um, and the uh, standard, um, you know, the standard's there, uh, it sets a minimum baseline, but uh, these cables can go well beyond that standard. And there's a picture of it. There's a little bit of uh, imprint of the crush plate on the cable, but, uh, but it's intact. Um, the flat drop is even tougher. Um, it's got two big rigid fiberglass strength members where the uh, round drop uh, has uh, fiberglass yarn reinforcements and the, uh, um, the two strength members almost act like the uh, uh, supports on a bridge, the, um, the struts on a bridge carrying the load. Um, so we were able to take this one up to 16 times the industry standard load with low attenuation and uh, we barely failed in one fiber um, at 20 times the industry standard load. Um, and you can see from the picture with the flat drop, uh, it barely even notices the crushing load is there. Um, then in the spirit of, um, you know, let's see where these things fail. And also when you have a lab, it's kind of fun to try to break things. Um, we did abusive impact testing of the, the same cables. Um, the requirement is you hit the cable with uh, impact energy of 2.9 Newton meters at three different spots, which is you drop a weight from a one meter height in three different spots. The jacket can't crack, split, or tear, and uh, same attenuation requirement. Um, so for the 12, uh, 12 fiber dry armored round drop, um, we were able to go 2x the industry standard load. Um, we actually had attenuation uh, at uh, two and a half x the load. Uh, that was unacceptable, and we went to about 3x the load. Um, we actually broke some fibers. But, you know, it's taking a pretty severe impact event, uh, as you can see in the picture in the lower right, um, and uh, and handling it. The, uh, where's my mouse? There we go. Um, and again, the tonable flat drop is super tough um, with its uh, uh, two uh, fiberglass rods next to the tube. Um, there, we were to go all. We were able to go all the way up to 20 newtons per centimeter um, and get passing attenuation uh, and no cracking of the jacket. Um, at five newtons, you couldn't see that anything had happened. After 20, you'd see see deformation of the jacket. We actually went all the way to 40 newtons per centimeter and had passing attenuation, um, but we started seeing jacket cracks beyond 20, um, and they weren't much. But it, it's uh, you know you could argue. You know, kind of look like a, a small splitter tear uh, after 20. So these are extremely tough cables uh, if you put them in the ground. They do have uh, decent resistance to, um, you know, they're not perfect, but they're going to be resistant to dig ups um, to uh, a certain extent. Um, they're pretty strong little cables. Um, the third right of way to consider is, uh, are you going to put conduit in? Again, if you're putting it in, you kind of want to be able to find it so that when the guys come in to put in the new water line, they don't cut your cable and trigger a truck roll. Um, there's three different ways that uh, uh, you can find your conduit. One is uh, you can put in plain plastic conduit um, and then put a tone wire uh, with your drop cable. Uh, another thing that you can do uh, is use a duct with a locating wire um, where the copper is embedded in the duct. Although uh, I have had people tell me that uh, you know, I'm not in the duct business and I'm not in the uh, uh, FTTH network business, but I have had people tell me that they uh, have run into issues with um, uh, the wire getting cut or uh, also potentially breaking 
uh, because the uh, the plastic uh, stretches a lot more than the copper does, or the the plastic and the copper stretch differently during installation, and sometimes it's it's possible to break it. And the other thing you could do is that you can throw in a tracer wire uh, next to the duct. Um, so those are all different options. It just depends upon uh, what's most convenient for a given um, application. Um, but uh, if you put the wire with the drop cable, um, you know that it's with the fiber. Then once you uh, have the conduit in ground, how are you going to get it in there, um, get the cable in there? Uh, one option is to push or pull. Uh, you put the fiber on a caddy. There's some uh, um, actually um, mechanically powered caddies, and uh, you can pull it with mule tape or, this, or a pull string. Um, or if it's short enough, you can push it. Um, and in those cases, uh, I've heard of people pushing flat drop uh, into conduit. Um, it's got to be a big conduit to accommodate the flat drop because the flat drop uh, is uh, eight and a half millimeters wide with the uh, without the tone wire and over ten millimeters wide with the tone with the tone wire. Uh, the round drop you can push in a, a smaller um, duct, although um, may maybe a little harder to push because it's not as stiff as the flat drop. Uh, but one thing that's very common in Europe and uh, becoming slightly more common here in the U.S. Uh, if you're putting the duct in anyway, uh, is to use jetting. Uh, you can use very small jetting machines that are tabletop type machines that come in a little uh, carrying case, a little briefcase, and can run off very small uh, air compressors. Uh, and you could jet in a round drop, um, the, the five millimeter-ish round drop, uh, or you could even get to very small conduit, um, five by 3.5 or uh, seven by four, and then jet in uh, blown fiber units that can be as small as uh, two millimeters, uh, 2.4 millimeters, depending on how much fiber you put in. Um, if you're going to pull the cable, uh, where's my mouse? There we go. If you're going to pull the cable, these are again pretty strong cables. You can put a pretty high load on these before you run into uh, uh, something that fails industry standards. Uh, unlike the crush and impact, we don't design these to um, uh, sort of beyond the standards. Um, here we design to just meeting the standards uh, because over design means more raw material. And means higher cost for everybody. Um, again, the round drop and uh, isn't quite as tough or, or doesn't quite have the strength of the flat drop. Um, this is a plot of fiber strain versus tensile load for the two cables, uh, where we essentially put it on a test bench and pull it, and we have a special instrument that can measure how much the fiber is stretched. Um, the fiber is tested in our factory to 1% uh, strain. Uh, to make sure that every single inch of fiber is tested to that 1% strain. And then the recommendation from the industry um, is that uh, the fiber strain at rated installation load be under 0.6%. Um, uh, and that gives a 40% safety margin against what the fiber has been screened to in the factory because not everyone else out in the field um, is uh, you know, putting a dyna dynamometer on the cable and measuring exactly how much force they're using. Sometimes they pull it a little harder than, uh, than the recommendation. But in this case, um, for a hand pull or even a, a winch pull, um, these have a tremendous amount of strength for their small size. Um, the, flat, the round drop cable, um, you can pull it out to about 120 pounds of load um, before you hit um, the fiber strain limit. And the flat drop, by the nature of what it is, it's got much more strength member in it. Um, the official rating for this cable is 300 pounds, but uh, you can pull it out to about 350 before you hit the fiber strain limit, uh, or you can pull it, I'm sorry, to about 325. Um, if you're using a, a, a winch pull, uh, a breakaway swivel that uh, breaks before if you exceed the rated load uh, is a pretty good idea. If you're pulling by hand, um, you don't need to use a breakaway swivel um, because it, you're going to even if you've got the biggest uh, uh, bodybuilder weightlifter guys pulling the cable, they're not going to be able to pull it hard enough by hand to, uh, to threaten um, the uh, mechanical integrity of the cable or the fiber. Second. 
Okay. Um, last potential option is jetting. Um, we have a jetting test track at our facility in Hyderabad, India, shown here, uh, and a Plum uh, Plumataz Ultima Z25 battery powered small unit. Um, and we have a number of different uh, blown micro, micro units that work in this application. Um, here's an example, uh, actually, of something we did last week. Uh, jetting performance of a 2.4 millimeter uh, 24 fiber unit. We're going into 8.5 microduct. It uses uh, uh, a jacket that uh, we developed and manufacture ourselves. Um, and uh, we were able to jet it uh, 1,000 meters in 10 and a half minutes with relatively low force. Um, final thing to consider, and I'll try, try to wrap this up quickly, how do you terminate these guys at the distribution end? And the questions you need to ask here are, what's your loss budget? Um, what's labor availability like? Um, even now, um, with things a little slow in the industry, uh, unemployment overall is pretty low. Um, what's your CapEx budget and what's your project timeline? How fast do you need to go? Um, if you're using fusion splicing or field connectorization, whether it's splice on or mechanical connectors, any of the bulk cables we've talked about um, could work. Um, but another option um, extremely common is factory connectorization. In some cases, people use the hardened connectors, uh, like the OptiTap style, and there's some new hardened connectors on the market and plug them into uh, terminals that are installed on poles or in, uh, in uh, pedestals. Um, and that these are weatherized hardened connectors uh, that you just screw in and don't need a separate enclosure. But in other cases, people use uh, traditional SCA PCs and put them inside weatherized closures um, that seal. Uh, this is a picture of a 4.8 millimeter round drop with an SCA PC uh, on it. We can directly mount that connector uh, on that cable. Um, and then how do you do it on the customer end? You ask the same questions about loss budget, labor availability, um, CapEx, and project timeline. Again, if you use fusion splicing or field connectorization, any of the bulk cables can work. Um, or you can use the hardened connector um, or the SCAPC or other types of indoor connectors. Um, any of those could work. Uh, what are the pros and cons? Um, fusion splicing is going to be the lowest attenuation and highest reliability. Um, and you'll be able to do a precise cable length with minimum slack storage, uh, but it's going to slow down your speed. It's going to raise your cost and um, raises a concern with labor availability because uh, fusion splicers are typically highly trained and, and highly paid. Um, the advantage of field connector, biggest advantage of field connectorization is you can get a precise cable length with minimum slack storage. Um, you still run into the kinds of problems you have when you have a connector. Uh, slightly higher attenuation, although in most cases that higher attenuation won't threaten the system loss budget. Uh, cleaning the connectors, um, there's a little more labor uh, involved um, to terminate in the field. And if you're using a splice-on connector, you're still using a trained splicer to, to put the splice-on connector. Mechanical connector, um, you don't necessarily need that level of skill, although there is training involved. And then the third option is factory connectorization. Um, that is your fastest deployment option. Uh, it's plug and play, um, and therefore it's going to be the lowest labor cost. Uh, however, if everything's prep factory connectorized, um, the biggest one big issue you run into is slack storage or installers there, they've got the long run length, wrong length on the truck. They've got a 100-foot length of cable, and the cable needs to be 103 feet to fit the application. Or they put a 150-foot cable in, and they've got to figure out what to do with 47 feet of slack. Um, in addition, uh, connectors aren't free, so it's probably going to be a higher materials cost, especially because you're paying labor for someone to put that connector on in their factory. Um, the last piece, uh, how do you get into the house and connect to ONT? Um, there are two options here. Uh, one that's most common is having a demarcation box. That's the demarcation box on the side of my house where it transitions to an indoor-outdoor cottage that goes through a window frame into the basement. But another uh, thing that's common is cordage inside. Um, it's a picture of a flat drop that is a three millimeter riser rated cordage inside. You can also do a round drop with a riser rated cordage inside. You can use common uh, tools to slit the cord, the jacket of the uh, cable, whether the round or flat cable. This is the Jonard flat cable slitting tool um, and expose the cord. 
and then you can just push the cord through the wall. And from a fire safety point of view, you're legal to bring it into the house um, as far as you want. Um, advantages and disadvantages here. Um, the advantage of the DMARC box is that um, biggest advantage is you can troubleshoot and repair the outdoor network without having to get inside um, the premises. Um, and you also have an optimized cable for each job. You have an outside plant cable going into the DMARC box and an indoor outdoor and indoor cable coming out of the DMARC box. Um, the problem with it is you've got more stock keeping units. You've got to have both outside plant, inside cables. You've got to have the box itself. Um, so there's just more parts to manage. Um, the cordage inside approach, well, you've got your indoor cable and your outdoor cable together in, in one unit. Um, but if there's troubleshooting required, you're probably going to have to get into the customer premises and have the customer be home uh, in order to fix it. Um, and also putting a cordage inside an outside plant cable just costs more um, than having regular fiber in there. And if you've got a really long length, length run, that, that might add up. Um, so to summarize and give us some good time for the uh, um, Q&A, um, considerations to uh, think about when selecting a drop cable to the fiber to the home. Um, first, what's your right of way? Are you going aerially? Are you burying it? Uh, or are you going through conduit? Um, for aerial cables, you need to consider span length and storm loading. Uh, for underground cables, um, you have to think about how are you going to find it and how rugged does it need to be for the specific environment. Um, termination, the options include fusion splicing in the field, field connectorization and factory connectorization. Uh, you need to think about your system loss budget, um, what labor is available and what their skill level is, uh, what your CapEx budget is, um, and the, what the project timeline is. Uh, do you need to be fast or do you uh, need to minimize costs? Uh, those can be a trade-off. And then the final uh, thing to consider is how do you actually get inside the home with the cable? Do you use a demarcation box and transition to an outdoor-indoor cable, or do you use a cable that has the uh, inside plant cable inside? Uh, final slide uh, about HFCL. Um, we do stand ready to be your low-fiber count cable partner. Um, we offer drop cable solutions for any right of way. All of the cables I showed pictures of are cables we make uh, and offer in the, the North American market. Um, we offer everything with the optional tone wire uh, construction for location. Um, we can offer the cables with uh, 250 micron fiber for fusion splicing, 900 micron fiber for factory or field connectorization, or three millimeter cordage to go inside the house. Uh, we offer fiber counts all the way up to 24. Um, we're willing to customize color, size, added tensile strength um, is something that uh, we specialize in. Um, we are focused on this business. We have 24 manufacturing lines across our three factories dedicated uh, to making FTTH cables, um, world-class uh, G657 and A1 and A2 type fibers, and uh, world-class quality. Um, we try to deliver value for our customers. So thanks all for your attention. and. Uh, I'll throw it back to Joe to uh, manage the Q&A. Thank you, Peter. That was exceptional. I really appreciate it. Um, we are going to open it up for Q&A. We do have plenty of questions down here, but I want to remind everyone to please uh, write your questions in. There's still time, and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, some of you asked multiple questions, so we'll make sure we answer as many uh, as, as we can here for Peter. Peter, I will start with um, this one here. And at any point, Peter, if you'd love to go through yourself and, and pick them out, okay. if that's easy for you, let me know. Um, but in the meantime, number four here, is there a direct buried or outdoor rated 2X fiber drop for open access solutions, MDU, garden style? Um, yeah, we can um, do a number of things for that application. It's actually pretty common in Europe and uh, uh, right now, we have a much bigger presence in Europe than we do in the USA, and I do work with the European market. So um, we can offer, you know, um, for regulatory reasons, all the drop cables in the UK are four fibers. Um, and so they, for an open access network, um, we could do a drop solution where we put multiple cordages inside, um, essentially a, a breakout style cable, um, if you want to reach individual. So we can, we can provision extra fibers for open access, or we can do things like, uh, breakout cables if you want uh, uh, multiple cables to reach multiple premises in a garden style. 
Excellent. Um, what is the maximum diameter of droop FOC and how many minimum fibers in droop FOC? Oh, uh, I assume that means uh, drop uh, FOC. Um, the, we don't make any, the biggest cable we make is uh, a nine millimeter 24 fiber uh, armored cable for direct burial. Um, and minimum is, of course, one. That's most common in the U.S. Um, in a lot of the rest of the world, uh, we go with um, more than one fiber for regulatory requirements, or sometimes people just want to spare. So, um, you know, we do, again, everything from two to nine and a half and, and everything in between. So, um, Okay, we have a question about uh, what about butterfly drop cable versus round or flat cable? That is a very good question. I did not talk about the butterfly drop. Um, that is the world's drop cable. Um, and actually, that's probably our largest drop product. We sell a lot of it in India. We sell a lot of it in the Middle East. We sell some in Africa. Um, that's a cable that's typically two millimeter by three millimeter um, with uh, aramid rod strength members and between one and four fibers embedded in a jacket. Um, there's an indoor version that's two by three millimeter and an outdoor version that's roughly five um, by two millimeter with a messenger wire. Um, and it's a great construction. It was originally developed in Japan. It's commonly used throughout East Asia, China, Thailand. Uh, it's the dominant drop cable in India. Um, there's one problem with that cable. The span length is short. And that's why the North America has been resistant to it. Um, in a, uh, even in a light loading, um, the span length just isn't that long. And so people look at it and they say, this is great, but you know, I kind of need one cable that covers all of my applications. Um, so it's, uh, you know, it's, it's fine for conduit. Um, it's fine for very short span aerial. Uh, it's probably not robust enough for direct buried plowing. Um, and, uh, um, it's just not commonly used in North America because the, uh, uh, the span length, span length, well, it's not commonly used in the U.S. or Canada because the span length isn't long enough for um, typical, for every application, and it's not robust enough to be uh, plowed in. Um, but uh, I noticed the, uh, the person who's asking is from Mexico. I am familiar with those butterfly drops being used in Mexico where the density of homes is maybe a little bit a little bit higher. Uh, it's a great choice if this, maybe the best choice if the uh, um, aerial span length is low, like really low. That's just the, been the one knock on it for North America. Um, in a lot of rural areas, houses are located several spans or maybe more to individual hoses. The span lengths also exceed the maximum distance for flat drop and heavy loading areas. What are options other than placing strand and lashing a drop? Um, that is the most common. I mean, the question is, how many poles do you have and how far are they apart? Um, but, you know, if it's NESC heavy and you are, um, you know, more than about uh, 50 uh, and the poles are more than about 40 meters apart, you're kind of stuck. Uh, with, with strand and lashing. There is an option that um, we didn't talk about here, uh, which is you can go to an ADSS type cable, uh, a low fiber count ADSS, um, but it's different than what we showed here. Um, the ADSS cables are a little bit bigger, um, but that is something that, that could be an option. Um, it's gonna be a little more costly, but you've got a unique application, so. Excellent. And then um, someone asked, what do you see as the trend towards pulling the drop straight into the home versus terminating on an NID on the home? Um, I think um, I think the, uh, the trend is to um, use the NID on the side of the house um, for the um, maintenance reason, although um, many customers are, are pulling directly uh, inside the house. So, you know, the nice part, the nice part of the deep, about the DMARC box is the um, technician can access it any time uh, in the event of um, uh, something going wrong. And in fact, the benefit of the, the NID box or the DMARC box, um, 
had a big old hickory tree that fell in my front yard um, two years ago and took out the drop cable and uh, also took out the power cable. And to the credit of my uh, service provider, we had internet before we had power. They, they had run a new drop cable before the power company even showed up. But they could, all they had to do was replace to the DMARC box. They didn't have to come into the house and um, uh, run a new cable inside the house. They could just plug in. And uh, if there had been just one cable, they would have had to get into the house and it would have been a much more, co much more difficult troubleshooting um, uh, or repair uh, if it was just one cable coming straight into the house. So I think most people use the NID, but, um, you know, it depends on the specific environment. And uh, um, if you're coming buried um, or if you're coming, uh, you know, then maybe you're going to have less with the issues with trees falling and uh, ice storms. And maybe there they're going direct into the house is a little more attractive. Excellent. Um, well, Peter, if you were designing an FTTH network, what drop cable approach would you select? Um, Really, and you know, this is kind of a design philosophy that we try to apply for everything. Is survey where you're building and see what see where the infrastructure see what the infrastructure already is. See if um, what you can do to take advantage of the infrastructure that's already there. Um, is aerial as reliable as buried? No, but if you've got poles available, use them. And just as when you write your business case plan that you're going to have some repair and truck rolls. Um, it will cost you less to build a network up front. And, um, you know, yeah, you're going to have long-term maintenance costs. Build that into the plan. Uh, if it's a greenfield subdivision, put ducks in um, because you don't, you know, you'd have to argue about aesthetics. Um, you know, one thing I've heard of and seen is uh, MSOs that have uh, coax and conduit are leveraging that conduit to do the drops or to do fiber drops. They're essentially doing uh, replacing or uh, re either replacing the coax with fiber or overbuilding with fiber to uh, to reach homes. So start with the infrastructure that you already have um, and work backwards from there. Okay. Um, let's see. We have a question about uh, what is the maximum span of butterfly drop FOC? Um, we may have talked about yeah, I have to look that up, but, you know, it's on the order of, you know, I think it's on the order of like 10 to 15 meters in an NASC heavy type application. Um, the, uh, and I think that's really the knock on it. Um, I think in a light application where there's no ice, again, I have to look this up to be sure, but I think it's on the order of about 40 meters. Um, my recollection, which, you know, in a lot of the world is just fine in the U S probably not good enough. So, well, Peter, is there anything else you want to add anything at all? Anything you'd like to say uh, before we close this out as a final note? Um, thanks everyone for, for your attention. Um, you know, this is, uh, uh, the homes past are nice, but homes connected, get you paid. And, uh, mm -hmm. if you need help, uh, with that, we'd be uh, uh, happy to uh, help out and consult, do whatever we can. Thanks all for the attention. Excellent. Well, it was such a pleasure having you with us today. So we really appreciate you spending time with us. Uh, please continue to visit iscmag.com for information on upcoming webinars. Thank you, for everyone who came today, for taking the time to invest in your professional development. And I hope you all have a wonderful afternoon. Okay.